Welcome everyone. My name is Lamari and I'm the Senior Director of Community Engagement at the Decentralized Identity Foundation. So if you're here today, you are probably involved with our ongoing hackathon, which is happening between now and December 1st. So there's still time to form a, a, a team. If you're on the fence about that, if you have any questions, you can always reach out to me, uh, but still plenty of time to get hacking. So I'm super excited about the session today. This is a two hour session. Uh, we combined it because we decided to take the session on DIDCOM fundamentals and then the session on Veramo and their DIDCOM package together as one. So if, um, so if this is too basic, if you like, you're the, the DIDCOM expert, you might wanna come back a little bit later when Nick starts to get into the implementation, that's gonna be at 10 a.m. Pacific time or you can enjoy the discussion because it's always a great discussion on DIDCOM and you might learn something. So um, if you haven't registered for uh, the hackathon yet, I do encourage you to do so. I'm gonna drop the link into the chat so you can go there and check that out. There's also sponsor prize challenges. So we have a whole page dedicated to what our sponsors are putting forward and their prize pools. Um, and also if you have not visited our hackathon server, I'm going to drop that into the chat as well uh, so that you can go there. And that's a place where after this session, you're going to be able to go to be, be able to ask follow-up questions and continue the discussion. So with that being said, I am going to hand it over to Sam, who's going to take up most of the next hour. Uh, we're going to have a, a break for about five minutes because I want uh, people to have a chance to get another cup of coffee, whatever you need, and not miss anything. And then we'll recommence at 10 for the Verama Didcom package with Nick. So I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Sam, who's going to start with the Didcom fundamentals. Awesome. Thanks, Lamari, uh, for both introducing and, and setting the whole darn thing up. Grateful for your, your work in making the hackathon happen. Uh, I apologize for not having specific slides to this. I'm using uh, some DIDCOM 101 slides that I have used in other places. And so I, uh, th there's there's not a recognition of, of Nick or, or Vermo in here, but that's not because I <laughs> I don't think what they're doing is awesome. Um, I'm uh, I'm being slightly lazy in reusing slides that I've that I've used elsewhere. Um, so, so that'll be really good. Uh, this is not going to be a listen to Sam to, uh, talk about the slides the whole time. Uh, we have some hands-on stuff to get into um, that uh, that will be lots of fun uh, and uh, the, and that will help sort of understand uh, the basics of what's going on here. Um, so I'll uh, I'll get into it and then we'll uh, we'll get um, we'll get going on the on the fun interactive stuff that we have. Uh, I'm Sam. Here's my stuff. Um, I am uh, I'd be happy to to talk with you about anything or answer questions or or whatever is useful. Um, and, uh, and and make that happen. Um, so what is DIDCOM? Uh, short for DID Communication, uh, DIDCOM gets you secure private peer-to-peer -peer messaging. The, the messaging that we're talking about here is not necessarily human-oriented chat or something, although that's certainly uh, an aspect of what you can do, um, but you can message about anything, including with some rich semantics. Um, and people ask how this compares to verifiable credentials. If verifiable credentials are about the subject of the credential, then DIDCOM is communication with the subject of the credential. So it's not uh, it's not primarily a data format or anything else. It's it's a way to communicate uh, between two parties. And here here's the basics of how this works. We have uh, we have Alice and we have Bob, um, and uh, DIDCOM is designed as a way to send a message to another party. Uh, it also uh, contains some information uh, in the messages that can help sort of th thread a conversation together or provide features like that, but but here's basically how it works. If you want to send a, a message using DIDCOM to another party, you need to know their DID. Uh, you craft a message, uh, and we'll talk about what messages look like. Then you encrypt it uh, to the recipient um, using the keys in their DID document, and then you transmit it to their endpoint listed in the services endpoint section of, the, of their DID document. So this is entirely based on the, uh, the DID core spec um, and, and all of the excellent work done there. Now, Alice just sent a message to Bob. Bob can send one, uh, can also send one back using the same process, crafting the message and encrypting it to the to the recipient and then transmitting it. I don't show decryption here in processing, but of course the, that uh, that happens for the message recipient. 
Um, this bottom flow is mirrored almost entirely, except for this thing that we're call that, that uh, that's called a mediator. I'll come back to that in a minute and explain a little bit about how that works. So, so why do we do this? Why do we have DIDCOM instead of using one of the other varieties of protocols uh, that exist? Um, there's a handful of properties that we needed. Uh, we wanted something, of course, that was uh, secure and private. That's like table stakes for anything uh, anything to do with identity. Um, the, the extensibility of it is important. Uh, DIDCOM is a little like, a, like an HTTP-based API in that you can just go make an HTTP-based API without getting permission from anyone. You just use the technologies that you have and you can do it and it will be a recognizable thing. And, and DIDCOM is that way. You can create DIDCOM protocols without permission from anyone uh, to experiment or, or do whatever you would like. Um, and so this is, DIDCOM itself is not a library, although there are libraries that support it. Um, it is a standard which allows it to be interoperable across uh, different language platforms or, or all sorts of things going on. And we're going to see uh, here uh, about Verimo later today in, in, in the module that they have that helps you speak DIDCOM. Um, because of the goals that we had, there are some specific design uh, elements that, that are part of DIDCOM. It's message oriented. Uh, so rather than an API call, which is a request and a response, uh, instead you have messages. Uh, you, you can send a message from one party to another party. They're not necessarily mirrored. You don't always get one message back for every one that you send. You might have a party that sends lots of messages and never gets something back, or, or, that, or that, uh, that sends a couple and gets one back and sends some more, or any type of interaction that's necessary. And the message oriented and the asynchronous go together here. The reason we did this is that we wanted DIDCOM to be able to work and support the devices that humans use on the internet. And uh, the devices we use are frequently not on uh, or connected uh, to the internet, um, but they're still the sort of the primary way we interact with things. Uh, so certainly mobile phones fall into this category um, where uh, sometimes you don't have cell service, sometimes you don't have battery. Um, but also things like uh, like laptops, you know, we close them and we and, and turn them off and walk into another room or we get on an airplane or other sorts of things. But these are still the devices that we use to communicate uh, across the Internet. And so DIDCOM is designed to be friendly to those devices um, and, and that uh, that reduces the requirement for what types of things you should, you, you know, you sort of need to have to participate uh, with DIDCOM communication and, and all of those things. Um, the, the need for supporting human devices also brings in routability, and that gets to the mediator that I spoke of before. Uh, you need a way to get a message to something like a phone, but you uh, need to make sure that, it, uh, that, that the you know, disconnections and, and bad signal are not being on um, are, uh, are, are solved. And so the mediators provide routable messages in the sense that the, the message sender doesn't know, have to know all the details about how it's getting to the message recipient. Uh, but the message still gets to the message recipient in a really important way. Um, and I'm so I'm happy to do some some interactive stuff here. Uh, any questions at this point? Since I've gone over a little bit of the basics and the in the concepts of what did come is. You're also welcome, of course, to drop stuff in chat, and I can address things from there. I do a lot of working groups, so I'm used to sort of watching a couple of different channels here. So um, yes. I will get you the slide deck. I don't have a uh, link, I think, offhand, but I will get you one for sure. Is the D diff decentralized web node meant to, the, to be a mediator? Um, not necessarily. Uh, it's possible, but that's never happened. Um, there is a, uh, one of the differences uh, with decentralized web nodes is that uh, decentralized web nodes are about data. And so you accomplish, uh, accomplish messaging over sort of a data construct. And in DIDCOM, it's about messaging that can contain data. So it's a little bit of an inversion of the concepts because of the primary goals of each of the products, uh, products, projects. Um, and so they, they approach things from a little bit of a, of a different perspective. Um, it is decidedly possible that there could be some more tighter interaction there in the future. Um, so identity hubs as the decentralized web nodes. Um, that's what I just spoke to. Um, so rather than being data focused, DIDCOM is communication focused. Um, in, in its, uh, its pursuit of, of accomplishing these goals. Uh, do the messages uh, time out and the sender know they were undeliverable? Um, there are, uh, for privacy reasons, uh, not report, uh, the, uh, the, it is not designed with a report back mechanism that, that, that provides you all of the information. Um, it is possible for messages to be tagged um, with timing information so that the message recipient can know that it's there. Uh, but it's fundamentally a combination of two one-way uh, communication channels. 
um, which means that uh, that there's some expectation of not getting the, the the expected response back in a timely manner is often what you act on rather than than an explicit uh, return to say that the message itself was undeliverable. There's it's uh, not getting too deep into it today, but there's a lot of of privacy reasons why um, we wanted to make sure that that wasn't uh, necessarily something that was required for involvement in Didcom. Um, specifically because of the, of the messaging, it often ends up with a human. Uh, DIDCOM can also be used between systems or organizations or any of those things, um, and, and, and that's, a, that's a useful piece of that. Um, and if I haven't answered a question sufficiently, go ahead and try to ask a follow-up, and, and I'll get into some details. Um, let me move on to what a DIDCOM message actually looks like, since the, that's the fundamental building block. Um, the... Uh, each message has some metadata and then some message specific content. And so uh, messages have ID numbers and they have metadata like a sent time. We also have basic support for, um, for locale information so that you can indicate the language that's been used to communicate and assist in translation uh, of those things. Um, messages have a message type. And the first part of it up to here specifies the, the, the message family or the protocol name that you're talking about. Um, and so in this case, this is the basic message uh, protocol, and this is version 2.0 of it. The, the last section here tells you which um, message within, or which, uh, which message type within that protocol this one actually represents. Um, and so uh, the, all of the stuff inside of body here is actually specified by the message type itself as part of the larger uh, protocol design. And, um, and so to understand what's going to be in the body and what the semantic meaning of it is, then you need to understand the messages here. It is not anticipated that code will be able to reliably process uh, messages of a type that they have never seen before. Um, this is, uh, so message types are, are, are quite similar. For example, if you think about this uh, uh, an analog to uh, an HTTP API, um, you'll notice this kind of re represents a path. And this is not, of course, where you send the messages, but it represents the types of things that you can receive there. So in, a, in an HTTP-based API, um, you know what types of information you need, to, you need to send to the server and what types you get, you'll get back. In this case, since, it's a, since a message is just the declaration of the stuff itself, then the message d d defines the, the content uh, uh, that's actually being passed. And the protocol, the rest of the protocol will d define the, the passage of data back and forth and what's expected from both parties actually involved there. Uh, basic message is a good example because it's quite a simple protocol, uh, but, but uh, you can get a, as complex as necessary with your protocol design. Uh, credential exchange protocols, for example, often go into edge cases and error states and negotiation and things, and so you can find some much more complex examples there. So this is what a message actually looks like in its unencrypted form um, as it's being, uh, you know, when you're evaluating it, either creating it or you're evaluating message sent to you after you've decrypted it from the other party. So DIDCOM itself works with any DID method that supports service endpoints uh, that, 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 uh, of the type uh, DIDCOM messaging. Uh, not all DID methods support service endpoints. Uh, DID key, of course, might be a notable one that doesn't. Um, and so uh, any, you need a DID that supports service endpoints. Um, and and the, there's some important stuff in here. Notably, it can tell you the URI that messages should be sent to uh, in, in, this, uh, in order for them to eventually get to the recipient. Um, there are some header information that help you understand the, uh, the, the, the envelopes um, with all of our demos here. We're going to be talking about um, a DIDCOM v2, um, and, and this, is a, this is a historical uh, thing that allows for upgrading to DIDCOM v2 from the, from the Hyperledger Aries community. Um, and then routing keys are important. Um, the, uh, this is, um, routing is arranged by the message recipient and then shared, and this, and this information is how they actually share it. So the combination of routing keys and specifying the service endpoint is how the message sender actually knows where to send the message and how to prepare it for, for transmission. So the message is always is always encrypted to the to the recip to the uh, to the recipient of the message, which uh, keys are elsewhere specified in the did document. But if there uh, if a mediator is in play, one or more, and you can use more than one if necessary, uh, then then the the key references that should be used to to prepare forward messages are specified in the routing keys uh, list here, um, and that and that provides an important aspect of um, of uh, 
of making sure that minimal information is necessary uh, for the mediator to do its job. The mediators don't get to see the message, um, but they do, of course, uh, know who the message is going to, at least for the next hop, so that they can um, so that they can they can pass the message in the right direction. And so that's all that's actually required um, uh, out of a did document. You of course have to have keys, uh, and then and then you have to have a service endpoint as part of as part of your did document. So here's a diagram that we use a lot to sort of describe where, uh, what didcom is and where it fits. Uh, so did resolution uh, and the did core spec itself uh, are, are an assisted uh, point of didcom here in the sense that we need did documents and dids in order to know how to communicate with other parties. Uh, transports are, are defined for uh, in a variety of different ways. The two most uh, common ones are HTTP and WebSockets, both of which will be used in the, in the demo that I show you in a minute. And then the didcom core defines the, the spec, and that's the, the, the didcom messaging spec um, that you can find. And then on top of the, 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 uh, the core spec, you can define all sorts of interesting protocols to do various things. So basic message was in our example before. Issue credential and present proof are two protocols focused on the exchange of, of verifiable credentials over didcom protocols. Um, protocols can be invented for any purpose without permission um, and, and, uh, and, and to do whatever you like and can be evangelized if you're looking for more broad support around uh, various different projects. Um, and so this is pretty important. Um, I've brought up the comparison to HTTP APIs several times, um, and, and this is pretty important. Here's a I'm not going to read this whole slide, but, but here's some, uh, some things that can help you compare uh, the, the different technologies in the ways that they're similar and their way, in the ways that they're different. Um, one of the nice parts about DIDCOM is that uh, the, the security properties of DIDCOM don't rely on the actual transport. So if you're passing something over WebSockets or HTTP or Bluetooth as a transport, the security properties of the message themselves are the same regardless of the transport in use. And that's one of the reasons why you don't need to understand or care about the details of, of mediation. Here's a different example uh, visual, and I, and I credit Daniel Hardman for the creation of this slide. He's, he's much better visually than I am. Um, a, APIs uh, ends up, end up, with very few exceptions, end up being a silo. Meaning if you, if you build a client to speak with an API, then the specific API that you designed it for is the only one that it can actually interact with. And there is some commonality there. Um, for example, often uh, like, you, you know, JOTS can be used uh, as, a, as, a, as an API access token, but by and large, uh, most of the API surface is very individual in the types of things that are actually uh, handled there. Um, how errors are handled or, or other sorts of things there. And so you can't take a, a, an, a, an API client that's been designed for one API and then just expect it to work on another API in the same way. DIDCOM is designed differently um, so that all of the fundamentals uh, building blocks of interaction are actually common. The protocols themselves are still unique and not all peers support all protocols, but all of the basic the stuff, including discovering which protocols another peer support, is actually part of the of the spec itself. So when you are speaking didcom to another party, you can ask them what protocols do you speak and get an answer back and to know how to coordinate or how to select a protocol to interact with that party. And so discovery is a really important uh, thing uh, built in there. Um, okay, uh, Bob with two Bs asks if, if I wanted to, to use a third party security scanning malware detection remediation service, where in the stack would, would the device participate? In other words, does the protocol provide for opt-in inspection services? It does at the ends, not in the middle. So the protocol itself is not, uh, is, is not oriented towards allowing for inspection of messages, but after a message is decrypted, any processing of the message uh, is, is totally possible at that point uh, for, for any reason. So you would, you would want to in, inject it in the stack after reception and decryption of the message um, in order to, uh, to allow that, uh, you know, the, the, the third party services to, to operate. Um, cool. Uh, so this is, there's some other stuff that I can come back to, but I think what is really interesting at this point is to get off slides and see how this actually works. And so um, this is something that you can participate in. Uh, you can go to demo.didcom.org uh, in your browser and don't add this other stuff. It'll be added automatically. It'll select a name for you. You can uh, click and edit the name if you desire um, and it will make that happen. Um, there's a handful of things going on here that, 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 uh, that we'll explain as we get a little bit into this. Um, on the left here is a UI version of the types of interactions that we're actually going to have and none have really started yet. And, um, and on the... Uh, 
and on the right hand side, well, the right hand side of each of the windows is the actual uh, log of the messages being sent back and forth between two parties. Now there's already messages in here. And, and the reason there's, that there's already messages in here, and if I expand this window wider, we'll see a little bit of that stuff there. Um, the reason why there's some stuff that's already happened is this demo is set up to auto configure some stuff just for the sake of, of easiness uh, in using with, with something, with a tool that you want to understand. Uh, these are both running on my computer, but they don't have to be. Um, uh, yeah, so not the Alice there, uh, Lamari, just the, just the didcom, uh, demo .didcom .org. Um And so the, um, uh, and you can go ahead and pull up. What, what's actually happened here is the demo has created a, a did peer to did for you. It's been truncated here, uh, but you can hit this button to copy it. And uh, and th this did has been pre-configured with a mediator. This uh, when it launched, uh, connected to a mediator, a didcom mediator asked pro, you know it, it, it asked uh, it to uh, to to perform mediation for it, um, and then it created a did and registered it with a mediator, and then uh, and then this peer did here. Uh, peer did is a did method that uh, is not registered on a ledger, and so all of the information you need is actually present in the did itself. Um, which is really useful both for demos like this, um, but also uh, for any time you you want a uh, you want a really lightweight uh, unique identifier to communicate with another party for any reason. Um, so these have both done that. Now these are incidentally both using the same mediator, but uh, but they don't have to be. Um, that's just a little bit of an accident of the demo. Um, and so uh, you know, theoretically, any any software that, that speaks the same way will work here. I have a note about Veramo. This demo is really new. Veramo uh, has been around for longer, and we didn't quite have enough time to hook Veramo up to the demo. There's some weirdness with the with the the, the did peer two method, etc., that we're still sorting out. We'll get that sorted out soon. Um, but uh, but the principles that we learn about didcom are the are the same uh, across here. So you can see, for example, the last message in the log here. Um, is uh, is a message um, that uh, that is of type message pickups uh, 3.0 status, and, and and this is a message that can communicate between a mediator and and a didcom um, software running didcom, um, if it's using a mediator to, and it, it it can tell how many messages are waiting to actually be uh, to be received. So you can see that there is actually no messages on either party waiting to be received. Um, you can also see uh, the two information here uh, for the for the did that it was was sent. This is this is Alice's one because this is a, an inbound or a received message. Um, if you scroll up on either one of these, you'll see the other messages that actually happen. Um, here's for example a Cordiate mediation protocol recipient update, and what this is doing is it's adding this particular did that Alice created. Um, to the list of dids that the mediator will uh, will help it receive. So that's a, a different type of a protocol. Um, uh, here is a uh, uh, here's a recipient update. Well, here's the one that actually requests it to happen, um, and then and then this message down here indicates that it's happened successfully. So if you scroll up here, you can see all of the messages that were sent uh, along the entire way. Now this is the boring part. I'm going to copy Alice's did, and I'm going to create a new contact for Bob. And I'm going to paste that did in here. Now, in the demo, you're copying and pasting a did. This is not. Um, uh, uh, this is um, obviously this demo is a dev-oriented demo. This is not something that we expect normal people to do. Um, and so the did will normally be exchanged in other ways: the scanning of a QR code, or clicking on a link, or something else that that doesn't require the user to really understand what's going on. So I pasted that link uh, into Bob uh, for Alice, and then a handful of things happened all at once. Um, you'll notice that this uh, changed to Alice, and the reason why is that uh, we received a message from the other did that indicated that Alice's preferred display name is, uh, or, or that that the, you know that connection's preferred display name is Alice. This is using a user profile uh, protocol um, that's been defined uh, very simply um, to do so. And so now we can see what uh, you know what that is. Um, this is not a verifiable credential. It's just self-asserted. There's no necessarily trusted stuff in here. That's again not the point of this of this demo, but rather just to, to sort of show the things that are happening. Um, we can see um, uh, that there is a discover features uh, protocol or message that was actually transferred back and forth, which discloses to the other party which which uh, uh, protocols are actually supported, which can be automatically used to tune the user experience or provide necessary features. Um, Here's a query to ask the other party, uh, you know, what protocols that they actually support. Um, 
here's a here's a request profile uh, message that uh, that is is requesting for profile information to be sent, etc. And you can see these things. So if I click into this, we, uh, the demo renders a lot of these inbound messages in a really nice view. So you can see, for example, which protocols are being used, um, and you can see the display name here. Um, and the demo is set up in a, in a handful of useful ways to be able to see information change. So uh, if, um, if you wanted to change, for example, Alice's name here, um, then uh, I can do so. And you'll notice that the, the name changed up here and back in my contact list, it changed. Um, and what happened was, is that Alice noticed over here that we used the user interface to change, uh, to change the, the name associated with this instance. And, uh, and we made that happen. Um, and and we, we sent another uh, profile message across. One of the nice parts about DidCom profile or protocols is that they don't, it's not request response in the traditional sense, meaning you have to request something and then get an answer back. You can also just push information to the other party. And so in this particular case, Bob didn't know that Alice was going to adjust her name and send a new profile message. Alice did it and then just provided the message to Bob and he can process that that, that is necessary. Um, and so, and so th that's a pretty useful pieces of, of how to actually uh, make this happen. And we'll go ahead and update that back to Alice. Um, the other thing that you can do um, is, uh, is uh, we have the implementation of a protocol basic message. And, uh, and that shows up down here where you can type something and it's actually sent to the other party um, is, uh, as a message. And so you can see that this message was, uh, was sent. Here's a, the basic message that was sent from, uh, from Bob. And here is the one that's actually received by Alice with all the relevant information. And, and you can see that it's been, uh, it's been represented in both sides of this. So one of the things that you can do, which is really pretty fun, is I'm going to copy this did, and I'm going to put it in the chat for the meeting. Now you'll see that that's long. There's did peer two, that's a, that's a separate discussion. Um, and that's the, this is the did method that the demo uses at this point. We're gonna expand it later for more did methods and, and all sorts of fun stuff. But if you wanted to copy and paste that in as a contact into your own browser window, then you'll see that, uh, that we have uh, contacts from here from people that are in our meeting here that, that, that are actually showing up. So I'm gonna click into Nick here and I can send Nick a message. And, uh, <laughs> and here's, uh, Nick beat me to it, but you can see that we're actually communicating back and forth. Because the mediator is in use here, it doesn't matter that I have two tabs on the same machine, or I might have two tabs on different computers on the same network, or in this case, I don't even actually know where Nick is, and it's still actually communicating messages between, uh, between code running locally in my browser window and code running locally in, in, in uh, Nick's uh, browser window. Um, which is one of the powerful things about DidCom. Now, obviously we wanna do more than just uh, make that happen. Well, we did have to solve chorus problems. The mediator in, in this particular case has to have chorus sorted, um, but, uh, but that's the only piece necessary to make it work. You don't otherwise have to worry about making that, making that happen. Um, and so because we were in a browser, we did have to sort chorus, but chorus is, is sorted uh, so that we don't have to have to deal with it. The point though, is that this allows for communication between any two parties, including if they are behind a firewall or, um, or there's, there's you know, other rest network restrictions that make that happen, because those are things that happen. Our cell phones, for example, are firewalled in a sense that you cannot just send a post, you know, uh, an HTTP post to a, to a mobile phone. Um, and so seeing uh, those sorts of things are, are pretty important. Now, one of the features we haven't implemented in the demo yet is that I can't see messages that people have sent. I don't have like an unread message counter, um, but that's, uh, that's something that we'll gradually improve as we, as we work on this. The other thing that this demo allows you to do, um, and I saw someone in the chat ask, hey, as soon as the issues are sorted out with Veramo, can we use this as a testing tool? And Nick already said, yes, and this is the goal. One of the nice parts here is that you can actually just type in any, uh, any message that you want uh, and actually send it to the other party. So if I uh, if I click in, uh, for example, here to uh, let me just do it to myself so you can see what happens here. Um, I can send this message, which is a trust ping message, which is not really one of the officially supported ones in the demo kind of on purpose. Um, and so it is sending a message. It's supported back and forth, but we did we didn't uh, automatically create that. Um, and so you can actually see the trust ping message is happening here. So there there's a ping response and before it was the actual ping that came across. 
Um, and so, uh, and if we click in, of course, to Alice, we can see the same trust pings um, that have gone both directions. I can send one back the other direction if we want. Um, this could be used to send any didcom message you want to the contact that you've actually added here. So there's a number of things that we've covered really fast. Um, the, um, and so I want to go back and use some of these messages to kind of talk about some of the, con uh, the concepts. Uh, messages have a, a message ID. This message is unique to the sender. It's the sender's job to make sure that, uh, that messages are not sent with the same ID uh, because it will be perceived as being the same message by the recipient. Um, but for example, if, if you, you may get a message, conceptually speaking, with the same ID from a different message sender. And so whenever you're considering the uniqueness of messages, it's the sender, the combination of the sender and the message ID that actually matters the most. Um, uh, you can also see um, that in, this is the ping request here. So here's the ping message that is sending a ping to the other party, and then it receives uh, a ping response message. And you can see that, a th that the THID is indicated here is actually the message ID that was sent in the previous one. And so this allows for messages to be correlated between the ones you sent and the, and the messages that were received. Um, this message has its own ID, but it's indicating that the thread ID is the, this message sent. And the thread ID uh, should be reused, um, and it can be the same thing. If, if, if the ping protocol had another message that went back the other, day, the other way, we would still use the message ID of the original message that started the interaction in order to correlate that information. And that's a way that you can use inside of your software uh, to keep track of, of, uh, of what people were responding to. Because DIDCOM is message oriented, you don't have to wait for one thing to complete before you do another thing. So for example, you could send a trust ping and you could do a, a, a discover features query at the same time. Um, and when you get the messages back, you can know which ones are coming back in, in response to which messages that were sent out. Um, and so, and so that's, a, that's one of the features that's used there. Um, we also have an epic encoded uh, date time um, and uh, so that you can use uh, you know, for, the, for the message created time. And you can also see the two information here as well um, and, and, the, and the, the peer did that it was actually from. If anyone here is familiar with DIDCOM v1 that was created in the Aries community uh, prior, there was a handshaking protocol required where you had to kind of trade messages before you really spoke about anything. And DIDCOM v2 has been adapted so that, uh, and you saw this when I only pasted it did one direction. When Bob sent his first message to Alice, Alice learned uh, Bob's did because it, it's contained in the message itself, which makes it really easy to, to handle and understand. Um, uh, I probably missed something. I don't understand who the mediator is in this demo and where it is. I'll explain. Um, we, we don't yet have, um, we have some explanations and some other things in here. Um, we don't deeply explore the mediator, not because it's secret or there's something wrong with it. We just haven't gotten to, to including uh, that explanation in the, in the help here. Um, there is a mediator that, in, I work for a company called Indicio, um, and we are running a mediator that is actually behind this. Uh, the goal, there are, there, there are other mediators, other code bases that do mediation, and, and the goal with the community, um, and this is a, a diff-owned repository that, that contains the demo, uh, the goal is to add other mediators in there as well, um, and so that uh, there's a little bit more configurability with the demo, and you can tune a little bit like which mediator is actually being used, et cetera. Um, so the mediator actually in play is one that my employer uh, uh, pays for and runs um, that, uh, that the demo actually connects to. Um, the, this is uh, not necessarily a deep dive into mediation, although there's certainly stuff that could be used there, um, and so we, we, haven't, we haven't really yet surfaced there. So that's kind of a detail that we, we handled in the background um, to, uh, to allow people to understand a little bit more before, uh, before they, they, dug, they dug into that. But that is something we need to improve the documentation on. Um, the other thing that's happening uh, from a transport perspective is that um, the, this uh, the code running in this uh, tab on my computer um, is downloaded from uh, from the GitHub Pages site where it's hosted, but no, none of the execution is actually happening on GitHub. It's all running here. And this page uh, it opened up a WebSocket connection to the mediator, and you can see that it's indicated uh, that this has happened here. One of the things that we have in the demo is that you're capable of actually clicking this to disconnect from the mediator uh, from a WebSocket perspective. You notice that all the messages previously like showed up really fast, right? Um, and, uh, and so um, this 
uh, that's because the WebSocket was connected. And, and, and when you're connected to a WebSocket, the mediator has the opportunity to deliver the message live over the WebSocket. And, and the WebSocket is an outbound created, which solves the firewall problem. Um, and this is an anticipated transport to use with things like this, um, but also things like mobile, the mobile phones. You could have a WebSocket open to the mediator when uh, the user has the app open on their screen uh, in order to make that happen. So I'm disconnected and, um, and I'm gonna send a message to, uh, um, from, from, uh, from Alice to Bob. And you'll notice that no message appeared over here. And the reason is because uh, Bob is not connected with, uh, with his mediator. And so the message is sitting there waiting on the mediator because maybe Bob's on an airplane. When Bob gets off of the plane and reconnects uh, to the WebSocket, um, he, uh, the, then you can use protocols to pick up available messages. Um, and, and this is, um, you, if, if you do this and scroll up, you can see the, the messages that were received and there's a little bit of coordination about uh, signaling that the message has been received to the mediator so the mediator can remove it um, and, and everything else. And remember, the mediator doesn't get to see the encrypted message. The message is encrypted all the way to the final destination, like in this case. And then, of course, the message was received anyway. And so this is a, a really convenient way, uh, having a mediator is a really convenient way to solve the routing issues uh, inherent with all human oriented devices that we have. Um, and so, um, so that's the important bit. This is some infrastructure that required. It's not purely a peer to peer solution if you do wish to travel over the internet. These same pieces of software are also capable though, for example, of discovering a Bluetooth connection uh, that, that, uh, that might exist that they can use to communicate with the same party if they happen to be in close proximity. And in that case, of course, no media is required because they're capable of sending into a message directly from one party to the other party. Um, and also validate that it's the same person they were communicating with before because of the, of the, of the keys that are in use in the exchange. Um, any I love the questions. Any other questions that you can uh, that folks want to want to ask at this point? One of the things not in the demo is a way to introduce everyone who is talking with Alice here uh, with each other. Um, there, there are uh, we have to discuss protocols for sort of group coordination. The reason I bring it up is because DIDCOM is fundamentally a, um, a, a message protocol between one DID and another DID. There is not yet the concept of, of group communication um, exactly. There are places in the protocol to indicate that a message was actually sent to more than one receiving party, but there, it's not done in a way that guarantees delivery or um, or, or, or you know or, or other properties like that. You can't, for example. Um, see a did in here and be confident that the message was actually delivered. The sender of this message message could have lied about who they actually sent it to. We've discussed um, the protocols to help coordinate that sort of a thing and allow groups to sort of fill each other in on messages that that, that have been received. But that's not something that has been uh, that, that is an active widespread use at this point. Um, uh, and so it's not quite there. Uh, images or menus. So images are typically uh, sent, or any sort of uh, binary data, are sent as attachments within the protocol. Um, that's something that, uh, that we can talk about just a little bit. Um, menus is an interesting one. And to answer that question, I'm actually going to bring up my other tab here. Maybe. Uh, here we go. Didcom.org is, uh, is also a, uh, a hosted resource that, uh, that is managed by Diff. Um, that, uh, that does a couple things. And we're working on improving some of the information here. Uh, we've made some progress. Um, one of the other resources before I get in too deep is book.didcom.org, um, which is uh, modeled after the, the, the Rust book and is definitely uh, in process. So for example, if you hit the quick start, you'll see some notes that, 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 that there's, there's work to be done. Um, we have some efforts underway to show a, uh, a uh, first a Python and then a, um, and then a, JavaScript example so that you can actually write code on your system that actually does this. So in addition to having an in-browser example, you can have a, a quick start code example using some libraries to understand how that works. There's some stuff already here, um, but uh, but it's not quite as tuned. And in particular, it doesn't it doesn't help uh, connect you with the with the de in-browser demo, which is really convenient. Anyway, there's a bunch of information here, um, including uh, here's some protocols for verifiable credentials. Here's protocols for human communication. And one of these is a protocol that was actually developed by the British Columbia government um, called Action Menu. And this is a protocol that describes 
uh, the, the providing of a menu from one party to the other and then allows the other party to sort of select from it. Uh, this has been used um, in demos and other things um, that help, uh, for example, prompt the other party to issue you a credential or, or something of that nature. Um, it's not specifically oriented around credentials, but it can be used that way. Um, and there, there's the information to sort of request some like form entry from other people. So this would be like self-asserted data um, or other sorts of things that you're just asking the party that doesn't re really need to be in a credential. Like, hey, we're let's go out to eat. What kind of food do you want to eat? You don't really need a verifiable credentials that says Chinese food. Um, you could just ask them and, and receive the text uh, back. So, so here's a protocol that defines that. And didcom.org is the, is a host to a lot of protocols. Um, and not all protocols that have been created have to be registered here, but this is a community resource that allows for these to be registered and discovered and, and, uh, and, and coordinated. We have some information on data agreements um, that, have, that has been done. Um, discover features you can see is listed here. Uh, there's credentials. Um, here's, a, uh, here's a, oh, this is super new. Um, REL has a new media sharing uh, protocol. Um, that describes the process of, of actually uh, of sharing information back and forth. So I can't speak authoritatively on this because I saw it about 30 seconds ago. Um, but this is the point: is that anyone can just create a protocol for for whatever they want, um, which is uh, which is really pretty powerful. So um, here's, for example, uh, the trust being. Sometimes it can point somewhere else for the documentation. Um, it would, that pointed into the spec itself uh, and elsewhere. So this is a growing community resource to, to help people collaborate around protocols, but it's important to, to understand that it's not required to host the protocol here. It just needs a UI that, that, that points to the, uh, to the documentation information itself so that people can learn how to do it. Um, and so, uh, so from a menu perspective, uh, this is definitely an option. Um, we also have, um, there's a question and answer protocol. Let's see, I was on, I gotta go back enough here. It may not be in here. It's probably in the Aries AFC, RFC. Uh, here's a question answer 1.0 here. Um, so the, the, the Aries community, by the way, is, is moving uh, towards DidCom v2. There's a whole bunch of stuff in production there, so it takes a little bit longer for that stuff to move. Um, but in some of the some of the early work was done there, and so you'll still see some links there. Um, you're welcome to help out, or or please be patient as that actually happens. But um, here's a here's a question answer protocol where you can ask a question and then provide a list of valid responses. So this is like a multiple choice, not an open ended type of a thing. Um, here's an example in the DidCom v2 format, um, and, uh, and and that way you can ask things. So this would be a great way, for example, to uh, let's say a website has a user that logged in and did something um, and then uh, and then maybe it was a batch process that took a while um, or or uh, and that's a that's more of a notification thing that you can use basic message for but one of the things you could do is that if you wanted to uh, if you if you had a didcom connection with the party from a website to a user and the user took an action which normally would require some sort of additional confirmation you could use the question and answer protocol to ask the user uh, hey, it looks like you just requested X, Y, Z on the website. Um, you know, will you confirm that this was you doing it? Um, and then you can re you know, respond back with a with a canned response, um, which can help the other party know, you know, what the what the answer was. Uh, yes, that was me, or no, it wasn't. Um, and uh, and that would be a great way to seek sort of out of band confirmation for high value things. Um, and so uh, this is another example of sort of human oriented communication. Um, that can uh, assist with and be a really huge value add to um, to uh, other activities like verifiable credentials, et cetera. Uh, question, uh, the question and answer, Dave McKay asks, is there a way to, to send a form to be filled? That is within, there is some functions for that within the question and, or within the basic menu protocol. And of course, if that's not sufficient, then uh, then a protocol could be could be designed to serve that purpose. Um, and that would be that would, those would be wonderful things to to add and, and have available. Um, in the the didcom book, um, there's a there's a bunch of uh, of answers uh, too about a, of various things, including um, routing that talks about mediators and has a lot more information, um, et cetera. There's um, uh, discussions about uh, about uh, about uh, mediators and you know dealing with uh, with mobile stuff. There's there's a handful of, of extensions. Um, that uh, that are not defined in the core spec, but are but are used. And uh, return route, for example, is is actually one of those things that uh, an extension is being used by the demo. Um, there's uh, uh, 
international or some localization information, for example, is here. So I'll let you browse that. There's also information here for the, uh, there's two groups at the diff that actually work on this. There's the DIDCOM specification working group, which is an IPR protected group um, that works on the actual uh, spec stuff itself. Um, and then there's a user group that is that is no membership is required and all are invited to attend. Um, and then uh, and, and those are discussions about developing protocols on top of DIDCOM or, you know, libraries that use it or, or anything of that nature falls within the scope of the of the users group itself. Um, uh, Raj, uh, so if the peers close to each other do not have Internet, does the com communication still work with Bluetooth on the same DIDCOM messaging app as long as they both support the DIDCOM transport uh, now? I have to qualify a little bit. Um, Animo did a great job designing a Bluetooth transport uh, for DIDCOM. Um, and then I, and I think some of it's been implemented, but Bluetooth is be between WebSockets and HTTP and Bluetooth, Bluetooth is the least implemented. So absolutely, um, as long as both parties, uh, you know, support that transport, then it would be entirely possible to have that happen. Um, the, the work by Animo designed it as a BLE uh, transport, Bluetooth Low Energy. Um, so there's some cool service discovery stuff that you can do there. You can discover the fact that another Bluetooth device supports uh, the DIDCOM um, Bluetooth transport, which is pretty sweet uh, via service descriptor. Um, and so there, I'm, I'm looking forward to more development in that area. Um, and I know some development has, but I'm, but I'm unsure uh, of the, of the popular state there. I know, there's actually some browser based, uh, based stuff. Um, uh there's some browser apis that do bluetooth and i've always wondered if we could have the demo itself talk with like a phone or even another computer using the same bluetooth api and i don't I haven't looked into it i'm that's wild speculation so please don't expect that to exist that would be a really cool demo though um so uh the didcom book and didcom.org are good resources uh for that uh, for that stuff um and then the demo um, as well uh, provide uh, provide that information for for interactions here. Um, you know, uh, if you this is uh, quite ephemeral in the browser, I should note. And so if you if you refresh this or you close it and open up again, all the previous information is gone. It's not really designed to be a, a permanent thing, but rather just a um, uh, you know useful for the the demo purposes that we've that we've described here. Um, any other questions? Have I put everyone to sleep? We're here. <laughs> Lamar is not asleep. We're, we're alive. Yeah. Cool. No. So, so this is great. Um, and and please play with this. Uh, again, there's a there's a GitHub link here uh, to the actual uh, code for the demo in the repository here. That that's uh, and and here's some information if you want to make this work. Um, then it'll work. And I did mention that we there's still some details. Um, I didn't get on the ball fast enough to work with uh, with Nick on, on ironing out the details, but relatively shortly, and we can noise it about when it is, we should have the Verimo uh, stuff, you know, did, did come stuff working with the demo as well. Um, and so there's here's some um, here's some details about what protocols are actually supported there. Also, the demo only supports did peer two at this point. Um, and there's some update updated work that, that needs to happen on did peer two. Um, but um, but this is this is the goal here. Pull requests are welcome, um, and you can also look in um, into the source and actually see. I'm I'm gonna have trouble going to exactly the right spot, um, but there are uh, the the source uh, you know for this um, and and how to you know handle the messages and uh, and and do all sorts of stuff um, is uh, here's for example uh, the method that handles the the discover features uh, message um, and uh, and how to respond to that. Um, and so here's the response message being uh, being created and then returned from the function. Um, so there are uh, you can of course dive all the way into this code here, um, and uh, and there, there's other examples as well. Um, we have coming, uh, not quite ready, but we have coming a a Python code example which shows this from a, a Python perspective that you can just run on your own, own local system. And we're designing that code example as kind of a code quick start to work with the demo. It's not quite ready yet. This has all happened more recently. And I also have to call out the people whose fault this actually is. Um, Colton on the call, uh, Colton Wilkins um, works for DCO and he has his hands all over this and, and, the, and the, the, um, the Python stuff as well. And I don't see Daniel Bloom. 
Um, he's also an Indicio employee that has uh, a lot of, of effort and creativity into the, into the demo in particular as well. Um, so, so the credit to those folks for, for their excellent work. Uh, Dave says this is helpful. I hope this is helpful. If there's anything that I've said that's confusing or whatever else, uh, please reach out. I will uh, do my best to to lurk in the Discord channel uh, that was linked earlier by uh, Lamari. Um, and so uh, so please uh, reach out. Um, by the way, there's there's no like there's no like logging or tracking or, or analytics on this demo page. So um, if you if you find it's awesome, like do us a favor and send us a note. We, we have no idea how many people are using it for what, because tracking stuff was not really the point of the endeavor. Um, and so uh, and so, uh, please reach out. Um, and of course the repo, these are all of these stuff that we've talked about are all in repos. And so if you, uh, you know, any pull requests or questions or issues, um, please uh, please raise them there using all the normal methods. And uh, Lamar just updated the, 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 uh, the Didcom Discord channel on the hackathon server. Hi. I made that channel specifically for this session, for this opening session here. Um, so, so if you have time to, as a follow-up, Sam, some time today to see if any more questions have popped up, that'd be awesome. And Love I, to, yeah, yeah. And um, I don't see any other questions in the chat, but um, as promised, I did want to give people a really quick break so they wouldn't miss anything in the next portion um, in case you need to get a cup of coffee, have a bio break, whatever you need, uh, go ahead and take care of it. Um, and then we can recommence at 10 a.m. Pacific time. That's where I am. Um, and we'll take it from there. Um, Sam, I know you're you're welcome to stick around, but I know uh, you're busy as well. Um, but then we'll we'll recommence with uh, with Nick. Uh, Reynolds on the Veramo Didcom package. Okay, so I'll see you everyone in uh, five minutes. Thanks everybody. I'm gonna lurk when uh, when Nick's on, um, but uh, but thanks for thanks for listening, and I hope uh, hope the hackathon is hacky and fun. <laughs> it is so far, um, and it gets uh, even more hackier. So, <laughs> all right. So um, I will. So I'm gonna keep the room running, uh, but I'll be I'll be back in five minutes.
Okay, and we are back. Hi, Nick. All right, so um, looks like we still have most of the group here, so that's great. So, um, so Nick, whenever you want to get um, started, this is the the second part of this session of our extended session. If anyone's just hopped on um, last minute. Uh, we had an introduction to DIDCOM with Sam, and then we're moving over into the portion on the Veramo DIDCOM package with Nick Reynolds. So I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to you, Nick, to go ahead and get started. Oh, I was thinking I was muted. Uh, cool. Um, yeah, so this is going to be uh, a bit different than the, la the first half. Um, I have some slides, but no no nice diagrams or anything like that. It's going to be a lot of uh, code snippets that we're looking at. Um, and I will share these slides because there are like 30 different links to the code snippets that you will uh, probably want to take a look at uh, if you choose to use uh, Veramo um, and our DIDCOM implementation in your uh, hackathon project. Um, so just super quick overview of Veramo. Uh, you probably already know this if you attended the intro to Veramo um, session that Mirsha led, I believe last week, um, but Veramo is a, a framework for working with DIDs, verifiable credentials, and associated protocols like DIDCOM. It's not, uh, you know, it's not only for DIDCOM. And, uh, you know, because of that, there are certain pieces of our DIDCOM implementation that are maybe a little bit less uh, fully fleshed out. We don't necessarily have support for all of the different protocols um, that Sam mentioned, but we will show you uh, how you can build out uh, support for those and what we do have support for. Um, again, if you attended uh, Mirsha's session, you probably know that um, one of the really great things about Veramo is that it can run in multiple different environments. Um, so the same exact code can work in a Node.js app if you want to run something uh, you know, in the cloud. Um, it can run in the browser. It can run on mobile devices. It can also run in something called Secure ECMAScript, um, which might be useful if you're working inside of a browser extension. Um, and I'm going to show you. Uh, again, this is going to be a lot of looking at little code snippets, uh, but I'm going to show you uh, how you can set up uh, the first two of these environments. So we'll start by showing how you might deploy a DIDCOM enabled cloud agent. Um, so let's get started. It's going to be hard to click on these links. I'm not sure why this isn't loading. It's just a GitHub link. Uh, one second, let me... Um, okay, this is a little bit weird. GitHub is not loading for me at all on my computer. Anybody else have any issues with GitHub today? No, it's actually, it looks like my whole browser is having some problems. I have no idea what this is happening. This is totally working just one second ago. The demo gods are upset. I know. This is not, <laughs> not great. <laughs> Something happened. I, okay, yeah. People are saying GitHub's yeah. working for them. Yeah, let me, let me try How does, something. Um, sure, yeah. I think it's my Chrome, actually. So I'm going to switch over to Firefox. I don't know what is going on with Chrome, but. OK, hopefully that works. Yeah. One one thing that we did before is we had someone um, else display the page, you know, to talk through it. But I don't know if that's going to work in this instance. 
yeah, it might be tough, but uh, I should have this. Um, there's there's one part that works a little bit better in Chrome, but Firefox uh, should be fine. Okay. Um, so I assume you can all see that. Yeah. Okay. So um, this first link takes you to the uh, repo called Veramo Agent Deploy. Um, and uh, this is a template repo that you can use to deploy an agent. Um, it's usually easiest. We usually deploy it to uh, Heroku, um, but it's also possible to deploy it to AWS and any containerized environment. Um, so what you would want to do is go ahead and fork this repo or click the use this template repo, make your own copy of it, do whatever changes uh, you have to the config uh, in your repo, and then you go through and click this deploy to Heroku button, and it takes you through the process of deploying your own cloud agent. Um, the most relevant part inside of this repo is the agent config. So this is how you say, um, this is everything that I want in my Veramo agent. So like I said, Veramo is, it's a very modular system. So you can have a lot of different plugins inside of it. Um, and the didcom plugin is just one of those plugins that you would want to include um, in your config. And if you scroll down, you'll see you'll see a few things. You know, this is how we define our database. Um, we here's where we define our did resolvers, uh, our did manager, etc. Um, and then you see down here we have uh, our didcom package. This is the package that uh, you'll need to include in order to um, send and process didcom messages. Um, but there's also this uh, message handler plugin, which is defined up here. And I know Sam touched briefly on message handlers, but this is another place where you will go in. And if you have a, if you're defining your own protocol, uh, you'll want to create your own message handler and you'll put it um, in here. Uh, just quick note, this is uh, in order. So, uh, these message handlers get processed like in sequence. You'll always want um, this didcom message handler first. Uh, I'll go through and show exactly what this does uh, later, but this is the one that handles like the decrypting, um, the, the initial processing of your didcom message handler. And then once you have it unpacked, uh, you might want to pass it to another message handler to do your cool hackathon logic on it. Um, another small uh, point is that when you deploy a cloud agent to Heroku, um, it will automatically include this messaging router. And this basically just puts up an endpoint at which you can receive messages. So this means since you have it in the cloud, it's not like a local client, um, you can just receive messages directly uh, to this agent without needing the mediator. Um, because this is just, it just has an HTTP endpoint. You can just send the messages right there and it will go ahead and pass them straight to uh, the message handlers here. Um, and we also have a community agent, which I'll be showing off in a little bit. And this is just, uh, again, this is a fork of that repo that I mentioned. And this is just the specific configuration for our community agent. So once uh, when I show that off, if you want to um, use a uh, very similar config, you might want to take a look at this and see the exact config we have there. Um, so that's how you would set up uh, a cloud agent. And there's a lot of documentation on how you interact with that cloud agent um, on the uh, Veramo uh, documentation site. Uh, and next, I'll show you how you could set up an agent in the browser. So we have a uh, a, pack, uh, a repo called the Agent Explorer. Um, this is a React application that uh, will allow you to interact with Veramo agents, plural. So it allows you to, it's a UI basically for uh, connecting to Veramo agents. So you can connect to that remote agent that you had just created uh, with an API key, but it'll also create a local agent that uses things like the browser's uh, local storage um, for 
like storing your actual agent data, your, your DIDs and your messages and everything like that. Um, so this is a great starting point. You're, I'll, I'll explain a little bit about how you can um, develop new functionality within this agent explorer without even uh, having to fork this repo because this also has a plugin system. Um, but it's also just a good resource if you want to make your own React application, but you want to see how we interact with our agents in this. This is a great place uh, to start with that. And I'll show you how we actually define our, uh, okay, this got 404 very recently. Um, Simon, do you know where this is now? Just a second. Okay. This is, we, we changed some stuff uh, today. I think it's probably here. Yeah, actually, I found it. Um, so uh, we call it a Web3 agent um, because uh, initially this was uh, how we allow users to connect their uh, MetaMask or other like browser extension wallet to use um, uh, like an Ethereum account uh, with your agent but it also uh, can run without a browser extension um, using things like did peer. So we have this create web three agent function and it will go through and uh, create some did providers. Uh, you know that, um, you know, Veramo supports a bunch of different, uh, a bunch of different did methods. It can support any did method if you write a provider for it and there's a accompanying resolver for it. Um, but just by default, we'll go through and we create uh, the did peer, did key, and did JWK uh, providers. And then if you do have um, a like an Ethereum wallet like MetaMask uh, installed on your browser, it will go through and create uh, providers for did PKH and did Ether. Um, and then this you see here is us actually creating the agent. And this is sort of the, the code version of that configuration file that I showed earlier. So you create, uh, you know, you, you pass it, uh, all these uh, parameters into the create agent function. And this is your list of plugins that you're going to be using. So of course you want to start with a, a did resolver. You might not need all of these did resolvers, depends on your use case. But you'll probably, you know, if you're messing around with didcom, you'll probably at least want the peer did resolver. Um, you'll need things like the key manager, the did manager. And then if you want to issue verifiable credentials, you'll want some combination of these plugins, uh, a data store, and then your message handlers. Um, so this is, again, it's in order. So you need the didcom message handler and then whatever message handlers for the protocols that you are uh, implementing will also go in here. Um, and again, nothing, uh, something we'll show a little bit later, but you can dynamically pass in message handlers if you are building an agent explorer plugin. Um, and I'll show you how to do that a bit later. Um, and just one other piece, you'll want to make sure you have the actual didcom package itself uh, passed in. So this is what will allow you to create your didcom messages. Um, so you have your agent set up either in the cloud or on your browser. And the next step would be to actually set up your dids. Um, and we'll kind of go through, uh, how you might set up three different types of dids. Um, there's did web, and this one is kind of the easiest. If you're using the cloud agent, this will automatically be created for you. Um, and if it's hosted on Heroku, it already has like a publicly accessible uh, endpoint for this. So uh, this did web will be created automatically and it will have the appropriate keys and endpoints uh, automatically added into the did doc. Um, and uh, so you don't have to do anything like that, but it only really works on a cloud agent. Um, did peer, these will be set up um, when you create the did peer, it has to have all of the uh, relevant information, you know, already inside of it. You can't modify a did peer later. So you'll create this with your uh, keys and the service endpoint inside 
uh, that DID. And I'll show you how that works in a bit. Um, and there's also, of course, did Ether, if you're bringing in, you know, an external uh, Ethereum account and you want to use that for messaging, um, you will have to actually uh, make a couple of transactions. So in order to modify the uh, did document of a did ether, you have to do a couple of, you know, on-chain transactions to tell the world about your keys and service endpoints. Um, and then of course, if you are uh, doing this in a browser, you will almost certainly want to use the mediator. And so there's a process for communicating with the mediator and setting up, uh, you know, asking it, hey, will you be my mediator? It will tell you yes, uh, because this is a, you know, it's all demo stuff. There's the mediator always will grant you uh, mediation. Um, so this is just a, uh, you know, a helper file inside of our uh, agent explorer, the identifier quick setup. And I'm just gonna show you a couple of the important pieces of code here. Um, so yeah, so if you want to add a encryption key, which you'll need for didcom, you'll want to call the key manager create function, passing in the type of X25519, um, cause that's the key type that we use, uh, for our didcom encryption. Technically you can use an ED25519 key, but it's just kind of better to use the X25519 version. Um, don't really need to get into why. Uh, you'll want to make sure that you also, um, so this will, this creates the key and this will add the key um, to the DID that you're talking to, you're talking about. Um, again, this only really applies to DIDs that can be modified like did ether. So when you call this function, it will go through and basically present you with your MetaMask transaction window to approve the transaction, which will then, uh, you know, put on chain the public key associated with this X25519 key. Um, next, you will also uh, want to add the service to the DID. You can do that just by calling uh, agent dot did manager add service. Um, passing it, you know, an ID type of didcom messaging. And then here we're, again, we're using the mediator. So we pass in the mediators did as our service endpoint. And then once you have that, your did document is all set up. You just need to send the actual mediation request, uh, which you see here, um, which I think is up here. Yeah, here. Um, and this just simply, it creates a mediation request. Uh, I can probably go through and look at this, but this will just create, create a message, encrypt that message for the mediator, and then send that message to the mediator. Um, and the mediator will of course, uh, oh, sorry, let's see here. So, uh, again, you're packing the message, you're encrypting it with authcrypt, and then you're sending it to that mediator. And of course, in this situation, because it's a demo, the mediator will always respond with you know, mediation granted. Um, and now you're set up to, to use the mediator without anything else. Um, so now you have your agents and your DIDs set up to communicate. I'll show you just a couple of code snippets of how you uh, want to uh, encrypt or pack your messages. Um, this is a bit of code just from some unit tests. The unit tests inside of Veramo are a really great place to see code examples. Um, if you ever, if you ever don't know how to do something, check through the unit tests, and that's a good way to see how to do it. Um, so again, you saw this in uh, in uh, Sam's presentation. This is how we are, you know, how a message is formatted, has a type. Um, because this isn't a real message that anyone cares about. We just, you know, we can type can be anything as a to from an ID and a body, and then you pass it to the pack didcom message. This is uh, a function that is part of the didcom um, plugin. And you just pass the message and the packing type. 
Um, we do support, I believe, four different packing types. Um, the only ones that you really probably want to use are either off crypt or a non crypt. Um, but you can also use uh, JWS, and you can even use none, which will just send a totally, totally unencrypted plain text message. Um, so obviously lacks all of the security uh, guarantees that we mostly care about here, but can be sometimes useful uh, if you're like debugging something or you have some situation where it really doesn't need to be encrypted um, for whatever reason. Um, and this will also, technically you can use um, uh, play these plain text messages, even if your DID doesn't have the appropriate uh, encryption key associated with it, because there's no encryption happening here. Um, so yeah, you just, you, you pack your messages and then pretty simply you, you send them, um, sending looks like this. You need to pass in the message ID as well as the encrypted message itself and the recipient message. So that's all pretty simple. That's like the absolute basics of um, uh, setting up your agents, uh, setting up your DIDs, uh, encrypting, and sending DIDCOM messages. Um, yeah, if there's any questions so far, feel free to pop them in the chat or just ask me. But I will, like I said, I will share this presentation because What's mostly important here is all of these links because you'll want to go through uh, and check out this code on your own later. Um, so we've gotten through uh, the setup and the sending, and now how do you actually uh, receive and process those messages? So like I said, if you have a cloud agent, that agent will already have uh, the HTTP endpoint. Um, so it will receive the messages directly there and then it will pass those along to the message handlers, or um, it will uh, use the mediator if you have that set up like in a browser. Um, and you can see, uh, this is just an example of our, uh, some utils functions for interacting with that mediator. And again, Sam mentioned some of these, but like uh, you'll have the, the pickup function, it will send a status uh, request. And if you see that the uh, mediator has some messages waiting for you, you'll then send the pickup message to actually receive those. Um, and once you do receive those, you they get passed to the didcom message handler. So we're not going to spend you know, an insane amount of time uh, here. But the important thing is that this handle function, it goes in, it grabs the message, and then very importantly here, it unpacks the message. So this is where all the good uh, decryption of that message uh, is happening, assuming you have the correct uh, encryption key um, on your agent that received the message, it will decrypt this message and then um, you know it it massages it a little bit, puts it into a slightly different format so it's easier to process. And then it will go and um, pass it basically to the next message handler. So this all, again, all this does is unpacks that didcom message, decrypts it so it's in a, a readable format, and then it will pass it to the next message handler in the list. So that's like the super basics. And now if you want to do some cool stuff here, you'll probably want to create a custom message handler. So I'm gonna show you a couple of examples of a custom message handler. Uh, there's a good chance that this link is also broken because I think it goes somewhere else now. Second. 
Sorry, Simon. Do you know where this one is? Off the top of your head. I've pasted it in the chat. OK. Uh, so this is a very simple message handler, which uses a custom. It, it, it recognizes if the message is of this custom type. Uh, this is just a, like a, a type that we use internally for, for testing. Um, and so, you know, it receives this decrypted message. It will check the type of that message. And if it's of the certain type, um, it will save the message. Um, and we just, we just call this a save message handler. And this would go directly after the didcom message handler to, uh, to make sure that we actually save these messages then can display them in the UI. Um, that's a really simple one. We have a couple of examples of some slightly more complicated ones as well. Um, so these are, uh, this is something called BrainShare. It's a, a hackathon project that we did last month, um, which is a way of sharing like basically text documents or um, like wiki pages. Um, and it uses didcom under the hood for actually posting that message to another agent. And then if you actually, you can, you can contact those other agents over didcom in order to, uh, like ask them for some of their posts. Um, and you can see here just examples of creating these messages. And then if you actually, you know, if you're uh, on a cloud agent, you might handle these messages, you received it. Okay, this is a brain share post. It has a credential inside of it. So I go through, I verify the credential, and then if it's verified, I'm gonna go ahead and save that credential. Um, another, uh, maybe slightly easier to understand example is uh, this one, we call it the, uh, machine learning text generation message handler or star chat. Um, and I'll show this uh, in a demo in a second. Um, but in this system, we have just two message types. You have a prompt and a response. So on the client, you might create this text generation prompt message. And then the whatever agent that receives that message will go and process it. Um, here in this handle function. So again, if it's a prompt message, it'll go through and then it will in its own like internal logic, it will get you the answer. So here this actually uses, um, a API from a uh, hugging face, which is an open source, uh, platform for various uh, machine learning um, models. So this will, you know, it'll just make this API call to the, the Hugging Face API with that question inside of it, gets the answer, does some little uh, processing on the answer due to the, the quirks of text generation uh, LLMs. Um, and then it will create a verifiable credential uh, for that uh, answer and then create a new didcom message that contains the credential, packs the message, and then sends it back to uh, the, the user that started this interaction. And you'll see here an example of uh, the two different ways that you can send messages um, back to the like initiating party. Um, so in the message, there is this uh, concept of a return route. And if you have this uh, field set in the message, that means that the person that started uh, this interaction wants you to use that exact same transport uh, for your response. So, you know, it starts as an HTTP request and they want that your actual uh, didcom message response to be in the HTTP response. So they'll receive it basically right away uh, through that. But um, 
if their client doesn't support that or they don't include that field, it will just try to send the didcom message uh, in the in the normal way. Um, so yeah, I let me uh, show that in an example real quick. Just one second. So this is the uh, Agent Explorer that I mentioned. Um, it's running in the browser. I've already set up. Uh, actually, no, because this is on Firefox, I don't, maybe I haven't set up. No, I have one uh, did peer here. Um, I can go ahead and create another. You can choose, again, uh, from those three uh, local providers I mentioned earlier, but we're going to want to use didpeer here. And you can specify a, a different mediator if you want, um, but we're going to go ahead and use the mediator that we know of. Um, it will also say, uh, it'll ask me to create a quick profile. Don't, don't show that. <laughs> um, just give it a name and that creates a little uh, a, a profile for me. Um, now I have uh, over here. I have this Star Chat plugin, um, and I can. Well, it's actually not as cool if you already see that. But uh, this is sort of like a chat interface. So I'm going to go in here and select the uh, the web did associated with my cloud agent that has that uh, machine uh, learning didcom message handler inside of it so that I can ask it questions. So I've selected uh, that thing um, and I'll ask it, what is didcom and see if it knows. There we go. Um, so it took a little bit. Some of that is the actual API call on its end to uh, to the Hugging Face API. Um, and some of that is because it has to go through the, the mediator um, message pickup uh, process. Uh, but this is returned as a verifiable credential with the type text generation response. Um, and it says that didcom includes, sorry about this UI, it's a little bit uh, messy, but didcom includes protocols for securely exchanging dids and did documents, kind of, and as well as protocols for securely messaging, calling and calling between agents. Not quite, but it did okay. Um, and, you know, in this demo, we're also including some of the, the metadata that is surrounding the LLM uh, that we were calling uh, for like auditability purposes. Um, so that's how you might uh, use it to interact with some some agent, some remote agent that has your like unique hackathon project functionality uh, as a, uh, a message handler. Um, and you can see it uh, responded there. Um, we also, of course, have like our normal um, uh, didcom chat, so a little bit similar to uh, Sam's demo, but just I'm on. Uh, I have my Chrome open in a different window, and I say hi over here on the Chrome side, and my Firefox version will uh, receive hi over here. And, and so on. I guess you can't see the other side of this, but these messages did get passed back and forth um, uh, just like you would expect. They both went through uh, the mediator to do so. Um, and you can, of course, you know, start a thread with any did. You can uh, scan this 
QR code um, from a mobile device to start this communication and so on. Um, and then I guess I'll one uh, last thing that I will mention is I said that the uh, the Agent Explorer, so Veramo is plugin based, and the Agent Explorer interface is also plugin based. So you can create these little uh, plugins that add functionality to the Agent Explorer without having to modify any of the code um, in the Agent Explorer itself. And that just looks like, uh, you know, I have my my React components here. And then in my index here, this is sort of like our plugin config. Um, it'll say, here are the additional uh, routes that I'm adding to the application and what I want you to render at the different routes. If you're familiar with uh, React Router, you un understand this uh, syntax. Um, and then on the Agent Explorer side, in my settings, I have this plugins uh, page, and we can go in and you know turn on and off certain plugins. So we already have, you know, by default, the Agent Explorer comes with, uh, I don't know, ten plugins for basic things like managing your identifiers, uh, profile credentials, emoji reactions, things like that. Um, did com chats, of course. Uh, we also have a few custom um, plugins, uh, integration with Gitcoin Passport, that Star Chat demo that I just showed off. Um, and I can go ahead and I'll delete it from our configuration, but I can also re add it. So the way you add a plugin is just. Uh, You'll see here that when you you uh, when you're developing the plugin, you can serve it locally and just uh, add it through you know localhost. I'll show you uh, exactly where that will be in a second. But once you have uh, built your plugin and you've pushed it up to GitHub, you can use the uh, the CDN provided here. Um, and actually, I'll show you that this just points to uh, you know some some JavaScript. But you can paste that whole plugin in, and now it's added into the Agent Explorer again. So you're able to add new functionality to this Agent Explorer without having to uh, fork the Agent Explorer itself at all. All you have to do is create new plugins, which you can develop locally, um, uh, and add them, add them like that. Um, are there any questions? Nope. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing just for a second because I might want to show off. Uh... So I did get a question. Would you use a mediator as a message queue or is there one built into the server agent? Um, I'm not really sure. Uh, when you have the... Um, like the cloud agent, it has the that endpoint, and it will just it just receives and and stores all messages that come into it. Um, and then you can write your own logic, your own message handlers uh, for how you actually want to process that data later. Um, again, it's all very it's all very plugin based. Um, you can handle that however you want, um, but I'm not. 100% sure I understand the question. Um, but I will show off real quick how you might develop one of those Agent Explorer plugins locally. What if thousands of messages come in at once? Um, that's a great question. We have not uh, handled that yet. We don't have uh, that sort of, um, we haven't tested that at scale. Uh, our, uh, our mediator is 
relatively simple and it, honestly might break down if you start getting thousands of messages at once. It's pretty uh, simple. It would certainly be possible to do a message uh, queue plugin. Yeah. Um, so again, yeah, you can uh, you could write your own mediation plugin that uses slightly different logic for processing, you know, high volume, and you just have to swap out that plugin. Um, like our our standard mediator plugin, you can swap it out with your implementation, push that repo up, host it wherever, um, and then use your own mediator uh, for your own needs. Um, so I'll just show real quickly uh, what it looks like when you're developing one of these Agent Explorer plugins. Um, showed already that uh, you just have a bunch of our uh, React components, um, and then you'll hit, uh, you know, you'll build it, which will create that uh, the, the distribution um, uh, file. And then you can host it locally. So this is what you'll want to do when you're actually developing locally. You don't want to push every single change up to GitHub and uh, and do that, but it can be hosted just at this locally um, endpoint. So again, I stop sharing, go back over to Firefox. And in my plugins, I can delete the one that is using the uh, version hosted on GitHub and just add my custom plugin locally. And it's exactly the same, um, again, because uh, in this instance, the code between the two is exactly the same, but I could make changes in my code, rebuild it, refresh the page, and see those changes um, right away. Um, OK, so I know that was a lot, and I went through uh, quite a bit um, really quickly, but we wanted to mostly just show you, uh, you know, the how to get started with Didcom, how to set up your Veramo agents, the basics, uh, basic code snippets for processing uh, Didcom messages, um, and then also how you can use the both the message handler system as well as the you know the Veramo Agent Explorer plugin system to develop new functionality really quickly. Um, there are a lot of little pieces of code here. Um, so I'm going to share this presentation. Uh, hopefully that link works. Let me know if you can't access it, actually, maybe. Yeah, that works. OK, the second link maybe is even better. But um, yeah, there are a ton uh, of links here. There are, you know, we're talking, about, this is over five or six or 10 different repositories just because of the way that it works. Um, there's the there's the core Veramo repo that's hosted now by Diff, um, but there's also the Agent Explorer repo and all of the different um, plugins associated with it. So there's a lot of different uh, places you might need to go to combine all of this functionality into like one unified product or hackathon. Uh, idea. Um, yeah, I think that's all I really have. Um, are there any questions? Just a quick question. There were a couple of uh, links you had in that slide deck that didn't work and we had to um, yes. go to the chat. Were those swapped out? It just would make it a little easier for people after the fact to follow your presentation. I will go through and swap those out as soon as this yeah. ends, but yeah, absolutely. Yeah, perfect. Um, and I'll include this in uh, when it goes on YouTube. I'll I'll link to this slide deck. Cool. Uh, is it possible to set up Verama agent and native platforms like Kotlin or Swift? Um, it might be possible, but it would be quite difficult. You'd have to um, uh, you know, wrap our implementation into one of those native implementations. I don't know if anyone has done that so far. We only uh, guarantee support for React Native um, for mobile devices. So yeah, 
we definitely recommend React Native. Maybe there's a way you could get some of this to work um, on, on Kotlin or Swift, but I don't think anyone's tried it yet. And it's possible to reskin the Edge Explorer? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can, uh, I don't think, we don't, we don't have any um, like theming, uh, but we have, uh, you know, it has a light mode, dark mode, and it has some theming built in, but I don't think it would be necessarily easy to do that through a plugin. Um, maybe though, it might be possible, but you can certainly fork the Agent Explorer and, uh, you know, and change it however you want um, that way, the, the rendering of it. Um, anything else? Um, I'll also just post a link to our Discord. So if you decide that you want to do something with Veramo in your hackathon project, whether it's using Didcom or any of the other functionality that Veramo provides, uh, and you have any, you run into any problems, definitely uh, reach out to us on our Discord in you know the development channel or the support channel. Um, it's usually the easiest place to contact us. Um, if we don't reach out there, you can always uh, leave a you know create an issue on GitHub uh, if, if that seems appropriate. Um, but yeah. Uh, yes, can we reach out to you to try and launch this agent as a POC, say in tandem with Azure, OpenAI, and Entra ID? You can definitely reach out to us and, and and talk through that that sounds that sounds really interesting um so yeah feel free to reach out to us uh if you run into any problems when you're building that out or you want to uh show it off when you're done absolutely um cool i think that's it then unless there are any more questions any more questions in the room I think we're good. So um, yeah, I don't see any more questions coming in here. So I'll go ahead and drop that Discord server also in the in the Didcom uh, channel to route people over there in that direction as well if they have further questions. Um, so thank you so much, Nick. This was awesome. This was a, a very awesome and unique Didcom sec uh, uh, session with uh, both Sam and Nick. Um, so as mentioned, if you have any questions, you can head over to Veramo's Discord server. Um, and also Sam's going to be around in the hackathon server as well, dropping in for any further questions on the uh, Didcom fundamentals. So uh, so thank you once again. Um, please reach out if you have any further questions and please register for the hackathon. Um, well, if you're watching after the fact on YouTube, we'll have all the sessions um, in the notes there. And then also we're going to be setting up office hours starting with um, one of our de uh, developer advocates tomorrow um, who can help people with some of the fundamentals on DIDs and VCs and also um, help out with some questions on DIDCOM as well. So, so thank you so much. Uh, everyone enjoy the rest of your day or evening and I look forward to seeing you around Discord.